story. I am a little bit tired today, so I think we're going to be sketching on the quicker side of things. Um, <coughs> I am, um, you know, I, uh, I actually taught, um, at a nature center this morning, um, a series of classes, uh, a total of 185th graders today. So that was exciting. Um, as it turns out, due to that, I might um, be losing my voice just a little bit. But I didn't want to miss sketching with you guys. So I took a short nap and I'm back. And this over here is the insect that I thought we might sketch today. Hi, Susan! I know that a lot of times when I post about the Thursday live streams, I post 7 p.m. PDT, where in reality, um, I am personally on the in Eastern Standard Time, so um, live streams start at 10 p.m. for me, which is good. Normally, I normally am up late and stuff, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty exhausted today. I will have to admit that. Yeah, Susan, 180 is a lot. And, um, tomorrow I've got 120 kindergarteners, right? They're breaking it up into smaller groups, but over the course, um, of a couple hours tomorrow, I will be doing a bug hike with 120 little kindergarteners. So, no, not all at once. So the 180 kids, at least, was broken up into four groups. So, it was four groups of 45. Um, but, um, I did manage one half of the group for the beginning of the class. So, um, introduced and managed about 90 students to make sure that they got to where they were going and breaking the, breaking those groups apart before we started the, before we started the, the, the walks and that type of thing. It's a good time. I enjoy it. This is, you know, part of what I do is not only live stream, but work at local nature centers teaching insect programs. Um, I was actually able to bring my scorpion and my tarantula and show them to the kids, and they loved them. Oh, it was great. All right. So, this little friend we have here. Let me go ahead and zoom out. <laughs> this is a tortoise beetle. Oh, am I going to show you the scorpion and tarantula? Oh, uh, yes. I can definitely show you my pets. Um, I don't have them right here next to me today. So, next week we can... Oh, please! Um... Oh, look at you guys. You are all so sad. I could... Oh. My tarantula and my scorpion are up two flights of stairs. <laughs> that feels like a lot right now. <laughs> oh. Yeah. This is a tortoise beetle, and it's super cute. I know it's on a pin, and I know it's kind of small. I haven't... I haven't thrown a measurement on it yet, so let's... From the front of the pronotum to the back of the elytra. My tortoise beetle is 5.1 millimeters. Or if you wanted to move that decimal point, it's about a half of a centimeter. So that gives you an idea about how big our specimen is that we're looking at. I remember 
This is true. This is true. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, I'm going to need so much energy for my kindergartners tomorrow. And um, then I've got a couple of videos to make, and so that's really exciting. And I have recorded my next whiteboard video. It's going to be on the Joro spider, the, um, the invasive orb weaver um, from China. I just made a video on that. Um, it's in the process of editing, and so hopefully I'll be able to post that in the next two or three days. All right. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in just a little bit. I have to zoom out all the way to get that measurement for you guys, but then I like to zoom in a little bit. Juro spiders, they also live in Japan. They are, um, did I say native to China? They're native to Southeast Asia, so they're native to a variety of countries, um, including China and Japan. Um, I don't know if we've confirmed the exact country that our invasion came from. I know that um, when we got the emerald ash borer, we were able to do genetics on the population, and we were able to tell exactly what port those emerald ash borer came from when they originally invaded the United States. Um, I didn't see... I didn't see a report of exactly who, um, if we've done any genetic testing and to see where the draw spiders came from. Um, but yes... They are big and gorgeous, and their babies can balloon um, for a hundred miles, which is amazing. All right, so we are looking at we're looking at a tortoise beetle. And I want to break this down for you just a little bit. So obviously, beetle, um, you're going to be in the order Coleoptera, but um, tortoise beetles don't have their own family. In fact, they more of have their own subfamily. So in insects, <coughs> um, so in insects, you have the family, and that is. Um, for tortoise beetles, uh, chrysomelody. Yes. Just double check that. So when we're talking about Latin, um, and we're talking about insects, like their scientific names... A lot of times, um, the family of an insect ends in I-D-A-E, idi, but then the subfamily, if you go one step further down, instead of it ending in I-D-A-E, it's going to end in I-N-A-E. Um, and tortoise beetles are all in the same subfamily of chrysomelids, and that is Cassidini. Spelled C A S S I D I N A. Um, bloop, bloop, bloop. Uh, so that's going to be your subfamily for all, um, for all tortoise beetles. Now, I'll admit, when I was a little person, when I was a little kid, I had, I might even have the book right here. No. My book is on the other side of the room. Um, I had the Audubon book, the, um, the Audubon Insect Guide, and there was a picture of a tortoise beetle um, in one of the beetle sections, 
And that picture made these guys, the little tortoise beetles, one of my, definitely one of my top three insects when I was a kid. If you were to ask, you know, what was my favorite thing to learn about or my favorite um, picture that I always kept going back to, there were three of them. The Ichneumon wasp, because I loved how long its stinger was, you know, its ovipositor. The second one was uh, the ambush bug, and I believe we've already sketched an ambush bug together. It's a uh, an assassin bug with um, raptorial front claws like a praying mantis. I just always thought that those looked really awesome, and they were little and small, and I just loved them. And the tortoise beetle. So... I figured today was a good day, I had the tortoise beetles sitting next to me, that we could go ahead and explore this friend here. <laughs> well, welcome Jody. I'm glad you didn't forget. And, um, I've had a little bit of a slower start, so we are about to get started. Susan, you love Ichneumon wasps. That's awesome. I have had some wonderful, some really awesome specimens of ichneumonids in the past, but actually my collection right now doesn't have an ichneumon, um, not with one of the really long stinger, stingers like you think of. I have an Ophion spot, um, species, but they don't have the really long ovipositors. They're a different type of, chrysom, of um, ichneumonid. Bye! Yeah, well, and that was the thing is, um, is Susan about the Juro spiders was that, um, I know that there was a lot of debunking to do because so many of the news articles were saying things like, you know, spiders the size of your palm are going to be flying through the air and all of these very scary sounding things that people don't really recognize. It's like, all right, so this is something that... It's, this isn't the first spider that's able to balloon. We've got a variety of them already in the, um, in the United States. And, um, it's a big spider, but no, it's not venomous. It's not gonna be, like, um, it has venom, but it's more like a bee sting. If it stings you, it hurt and go away. Unless you were allergic to it. Like, those types of things. Alright, so I'm going ahead and sketching the outline of my, of my, um, of my tortoise beetle. I'm going to go ahead and write. Tortoise beetle. Alrighty. Um, and so there are a couple of things that you can see from the top. This large shield right here, that's the pronotum. So we can't really see the head from the top until we zoom in. And I believe a part of the pronotum is actually kind of see-through. So we'll be able to see a top, the top of his head kind of through the pronotum. Um, and then this side and that side, those are our elytra, right? Those are the shield, those are the, um, hard outer wings that protect the nice soft membranous inner wings that the tortoise beetles will fly with. And I gotta tell you, they do fly a lot. Um, I never collected one as a kid, and it was definitely one that I always wanted to find, but was never able to find. And then... I learned the secret when I got to college. Tortoise beetles really like morning glory. Like, love morning glory. So, if you are walking around out in the woods and you see uh, morning glory, which a lot of times in um, the form that I find tortoise beetles on it, it's like a vine that's kind of growing within a field or growing within other plants. And I'll look over into the, into the morning glory and you'll see lots of little circular holes all over the leaves. And that's when you know you've got tortoise beetles. <laughs> Cause they really love this stuff. Um, and some tortoise beetles, not this species, but some tortoise beetles, like the ones that are um, speckled with gold, uh, they actually will change colors while they mate, which is kind of fun. They'll go from gold to red and back. Ugh. 
That's really cool that you, Susan, that you got to watch Ichneumon's laying eggs. Alright, I think, I zoomed in, but I think I'm going to zoom in even further. I want to see about looking at this head. Alright, Jody, so you have morning glory. You might end up with tortoise beetles at some point. They're not really going to be eating the flowers as much as eating the leaves. So I would watch your leaves and see if you end up with any. I guess most people wouldn't be too excited about them, but they're so cute. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so I was trying to zoom in to see if we could kind of see the head. Now, I want to show you this really cool texture that the pronotum has before we go too much further. Uh, I want more light. Give me more light. Aha! Uh -huh. We have more light. This is a good example right there. Stay. All right, so when you're looking at the pronotum, it's a little bit difficult to see because the focus changes so quickly here. It's kind of on an arch on its back. But you can see in this area that you have all of these little circles. Um, uh, I've always thought that this texture was really cool on the pronotum. And you can see all of these clear areas. They're not just clear because... Um, it's their color, they're actually kind of see-through here. So right about here where you see it come up like this, that's actually the head. All right. Yes, Avea, her textures. Very good. Yeah, so that's a really cool kind of texture that I love, all of those circles. Now, it uh, reminds me a little bit of the lace bug that we did. All of those circles and those kind of bubbles within the pronotum? I think so. Alrighty. This might work. There! to be that type of influence. That is my goal, is to help people find, um, to find a love or an appreciation of insects where they may not have had one in the past. And I think that I did a pretty good job with my fifth graders too today. I had even one girl who said she was absolutely afraid of insects and wouldn't go anywhere near them, and then, um, ended up holding a blue death feigning beetle. So I was pretty excited about that. All right, now um, I'm going in and I'm zooming in on the on the pronotum, and I'm going in and making some kind of final sketch lines in here. Um, there aren't a lot of detailed characteristics from the top, but um, I'm okay with flipping them over and doing also a quick sketch and maybe his head after we got this taken care of. So we've got this pronotum; it's nice and roundy and flat. I love it. All right, um, I know that it's a little bit more difficult to see right about here. Let's see if I can bump it just a little bit up. Right about here, there is a scutellum, I promise you. The little triangle in between the two elytra. There, you can almost see it, no better. All right. So I'm going ahead and giving this sketch these angles, and then when I get about to the center here, instead of going straight across, my pronotum does have this little dimple, this little divot, before it ke keeps continuing over, and I do believe that even underneath that, you're going to also have that um, triangular scutellum that kind of dips
like this. Oh man! I have to tell you about tortoise beetle babies. I'm going to make sure I'm remembering this right because it was really cool. Yes. All right. So, tortoise beetles. Now, this guy right here, he's got that l nice large pronotal shield um, is what I'm going to call that. Uh, we're going to go all about two-thirds of the way up, and he's got that very dark um, kind of pattern here that I want to kind of copy. Um, so right about here, this dark pattern, that is on the pronotum. So I want to get that on to my sketch because it, that's going to be characteristic. Um, when we're trying to identify it, a lot of times that's going to help. I think that if I looked really hard, I probably could have figured out the species of this individual. Um, so if anybody wants to do a little bit of research on iNaturalist or Bug Guide, I bet you it wouldn't be too difficult to find out what the species is on this individual. I just haven't done it yet. All right, and then up here on top of this, um, and this is kind of behind the pronotum, is the extension of the head. Along those lines. Um, let's see. Susan asked, is that pattern a texture on the surface or a change in the transparency within the pronotum? Good question. It is a change in transparency within the pronotum. So if you were to touch the outside of the of that place where it looked kind of webbed, it would be completely smooth. Those aren't ridges or indents that you're seeing that make that pattern. It's just um, internal. Um, yeah, it's completely internal, which is sweet. So do they all do they all have spacesuit helmets? Um, I mean, kind of. Here, I'll show you another. Um, I'll show you another species. I've got this species too that I have right here with me. And if I zoom in on the head. The patterning on this pronotum is actually very, very distinct. So this is another species of tortoise beetle, and you can see it's got that really awesome patterning here, and that patterning is once again internal, inside of the pronotum, not um, any types of ridges or indentations in the actual exoskeleton. Um, this individual is mostly a kind of gold and yellow color with a couple of spots. Um, yeah, but they've got that awesome, crazy, I guess we're going to call it spacesuit helmets. Okay, so um, we do have... <laughs> Yeah, I I um I was having that I was having that same kind of issue with um this tortoise beetle. I actually haven't sketched a tortoise beetle before. I just love them so much and he was sitting next to me and I thought, well, we can give him a try. All right. We do have these antenna we can work with. Um I would say that they are enlarged towards the end, but I don't know if I would call these knobbed, right? Because they it's got a good number of, um, of antennal segments that get wider. Um, let me go ahead and see. Yeah, so even those little segments, 
in those spin segments, there's multiple of them. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right, so I'm counting a total of eleven segments um, in my antenna. So if you want to start here at the top, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, that you can see that are kind of enlarged. And then these ones that are thinner go 7, 8, 9, 10, and then a little one to start would be 11. So I'm going to be bringing, um, I'm going to go ahead and darken my head out just a little bit. And then I'm going to bring these antenna up. So one two segments before they come up into above the pronotum and then we've got looks like three longer thin segments and then we worry about um, growing expanding this um, these antenna so one two three four five six more as they're growing. So we've got one that's kind of bigger and then they're going to be more the square shape. And then the last one gets to have that really fun kind of pointy wide shape. So that's um, something like our antenna look like and then we're going to go ahead and kind of um, darken the last couple of segments because they get um, dark as it continues on. And I'm going to try and see if I can go ahead and sketch that same thing on the other side. Those three nice long thin segments along with a long segment with a hook on the end of it. Alrighty. Yes, the antenna come out from under the pronotum because the antenna are actually connected to the head. All right, so if you're looking, this is the head right here, and the pronotum is the first segment of the thorax. So it's um, a shield that's pushing forward to help protect the head. Um, but the antenna, so that makes it look like the antenna are coming out from under the pronotum, but they're really just connected right about here to the head. Um, so if I turn the specimen, that might help you a little bit. From memory, these guys look cute head on. Yes, look how adorable they are head on. All right, so this is what my this is what my tortoise beetle looks like when we flip it over and we look at the head from underneath. Hence tortoise beetle because its head is tucked under the shield for protection. Yeah, I think that that would be pretty realistic. I think that they're very, very rotund, very round shape. And also the fact that they tuck their head kind of into what looks like a shell. Um, that both of those things make them a great um, tortoise beetle. Um, and yes, right here and right here, those are the compound eyes. They are silver rather than our normal kind of compound black that you have a lot of times. And um, Marley, I think you're asking if this dark spot right here is a pupil. And I don't think that it is. But I honestly am not sure what that is because the other side doesn't have that dark spot. Um, sometimes I know insects like a praying mantis will get a dark spot in their eyes from rubbing them too much or from rubbing their eyes against plastic containers. They can actually kind of wear spots down in their eyes that become these black spots and they become like spots that the insect is blind. They can't see through it. Um, I'm not sure if that's what's happening to the tortoise beetle because I've not seen that in tortoise beetles before, but I have seen it in praying mantids and that's what it's from. 
Um, and I wonder if, no, that's as far as we can zoom in. So there is no going any closer than that. I just think she's so cute. Look at that. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and flip this tortoise beetle back over and we're gonna look at the elytra. I wonder if we call those humeral angles in beetles. Why is it so zoomed in today? Hmm. There we go. I'm trying to figure out if we would call these shoulders their humeral angle. If this was a true bug, if this was a stink bug, I would be calling those corners their their humeral angle. But I'm not sure if I would call it the same thing for a beetle. Darn. All right, so it's got this dark patterning on its elytra. This right here, that's see-through again, um, is going to also have that same kind of bubbly internal pattern that we've got that we got going on. Um, let's go ahead and turn my sketch back on. All right, so I've kind of figured that out. I've gotten my I've gotten my scutellum right. This little triangle in between. Um, in between the elytra that is called the scutellum and then we have two elytra which are these hardened outer wings that have all of this nifty patterning on it um, I believe that if you were to go ahead and zoom in the elytra don't align directly with there's a little bit of a separation in between the pronotum and the elytra you can kind of see that sh here Elytra is spelled E-L-Y-T-R-A, and it is our word for beetle front wings. All right, so there's a variety of different types of wings in insects. You have membranous wings. We see those a lot of times in wasps and flies, those wings that you can see through and you've got all the veins. Um, in beetles, this first pair um, of front wings that are hard, they're a shell, and they help protect the uh, membranous wings underneath. That's what we call elytra. Um, and then uh, we have something called hemielytra in true bugs, which are half um, hard and half membranous wings. Um, and we have examples of those in insects like stink bugs and assassin bugs. All right, so I'm going ahead and, yes, Marley, thank you. Um, adding my elytra. And I'm going ahead and giving it a little bit, just a little bit past this pronotum. My, um, my microscope seems to be confused about the lighting because it wants to see through these edges. So you can see it's kind of over, um, overcompensating a little bit. So it's kind of brightening it out. I wonder, we'll have to see if I can get it to go any darker. But I'm going to go ahead and take these angles and circle them down. Oh, look how cute it is. I'm a fan. All right. And then we take this line right here from the end of the scutellum and we give one lateral vertical line. Um, and so that breaks our wings into the left side and the right side. Now, um, the wings underneath, uh, underneath the elytra are really awesome because they have all of these really wild, um, 
like uh, fold marks. So the membranous wings also fold up underneath these. So when he opens his wings to fly, he not only has to open the shield, but then he has to kind of unfurl his hind wings um, so that he has the ability to fly. Now I'm going to go ahead and give him this. And I believe... So the spotted bits of a ladybug or a light of elytra. Yes, exactly. All right, and that was the other thing I was looking for. I wanted to see if this um, area of the elytra that are very much um, see-through um, goes all the way around, and they do. So I'm going to go ahead and modify my sketch a little bit, bring this dark up tiger beetles also have spotted elytra a lot of times all right, so we've got this darker area, and then we have all of those lighter areas. Now, I believe if I was to zoom in, we could talk a little, we could talk one bonus texture, I believe. Almost. I was trying to see if there were really obvious punctations in the elytra, but there are not. Let's go ahead and leave that for a minute. So we can see this really nifty texture in here. It almost looks like it's dark with kind of little bubbles inside. All right, now I have <coughs> I have a story to share with you. And this story is about the babies of tortoise beetles. Now, um, if you have morning glory in your backyard, you should watch for these guys too. Because I think that they would be a great fun thing to watch sketch a nature journal because of their behaviors and their uh, because of their behaviors yes the punctations are the strawberry texture exactly I was trying to find um, it at a good angle that I could show it to you I can see it under the microscope but I was having a hard time with the lighting really getting into it um, when we're talking about um, when we're talking about punctations, um, a lot of times we are talking about what looks like somebody took a, took a needle and just poked a bunch of holes in your, um, just poked a bunch of holes in the exoskeleton. They look like a bunch of little, little divots. And so I could totally see how that would almost look like a strawberry texture where it was very divoted. Um, you can almost see like the little specks here and the reflection of the light. And I believe that the punctations on this elytra are actually in rows and they go horizontally. And so I was trying to show you that, but they are going to be along the lines of this where you've got these punctations. And there aren't really a lot of them, which is why I was having a harder time kind of zooming in. But they are all kind of in these vertical lines. And the punctations are mostly in this dark color. Once you get into this lighter color where it was like that see-through, you had more of that bubbly texture where there were lots of little circles that you could almost see through. Creme brulee. Okay, fair enough. All right, so story time. The baby tortoise beetles. Um, I do not have a specimen of baby tortoise beetles, but uh, you can um, look up tortoise beetle grub. I promise you, you won't be... Um, uh, 
you won't be let down. There's some pretty awesome specimens out there. A lot of times they've got kind of a dark uh, to black, a black to dark brown head capsule. And then along their body, um, along their body, which is kind of a lot of times fairly fat. Like they've got these kind of nice, wide, very, very plump bodies. Um, and then on both sides of their bodies, a lot of times they've got these really awesome, like, spine look at, they look very spiny. Um, imagine, like, a ladybug grub, um, a baby ladybug, you know how they've got all of those spines on the edges? Well, um, tortoise beetle grubs will also have these kind of long spines, and even sometimes the individual spines will have bonus barbs on them to look really nice and scary. And then, if you get all the way to the end of the abdomen of your tortoise beetle grub, it kind of comes down to a point, and it's got these, like, two little hooks down there at the bottom. Now, a lot of times, you don't see this part right here, of the tortoise beetle grub because it has a behavior that is very, very unique. <laughs> they, every time, every time, so insects, they're going to be eating, especially these babies, right? Their goal in life is to eat, to poop, to shed their exoskeleton and to grow bigger. Like, that is their goal. And all the while, trying not to be killed, right? Trying not to be eaten by a bird. So, these beetle grubs decided, you know, the best way to not be eaten by birds is to create kind of like a garbage umbrella. <laughs> every time, um, every time uh, this beetle poops or releases frass from the end of its abdomen, instead of it just dropping to the ground, he holds on to it. All right. And he might do it, uh, he might go again, and he just keeps stacking his own frass on top of itself. And then, if he sheds his exoskeleton, well, that goes on the pile, too. And so he'll have pieces of his old exoskeleton. He has piles of, um, he has piles of frass. He has more exoskeleton. He's got piles of poop. And by the time you see these grubs, a lot of times it looks like they're waving this big black thing over top of their head. It's because they're actually waving essentially a garbage receptacle umbrella above their heads. And um, that is to keep the birds from eating them. Because if you look like a pile of poop, then birds probably are not going to eat you. Um, <laughs> and yes, Susan, everything comes down to the bug butt. All right. We love them. <laughs> um, eat, grow, and shed my exoskeleton. I love it. You know, I got little entomological related shirts for my niece. And I saw, and I sent her one that said, like, second instar growing up, and it looked like it had a little bug with a bug nut on it. I was really excited. <laughs> I'm going to add some of these circles into this see-through. I want to see if I can create some type of texturing that looks almost realistic. Yeah, so I think that that is a great story to tell people. And if you see Morning Glory with a lot of holes in it, go ahead and slow your walk down. These guys, a lot of times, even though they have um, this extra bonus um, poop umbrella, um, they will also, a lot of times to protect themselves, be on the bottom side of the leaf rather than the top side. So um, when you're looking, go ahead and kind of flip over some of the leaves, especially ones that you see that have holes in them. If they've been chewed on, it's likely from these guys. Now, they do have chewing mouth parts rather than piercing and sucking. So they're actually taking little bits of the leaves out rather than something like a stink bug. If a stink bug was feeding on the plant, it would have more of a, um, of a speckled texture because stink bugs create damage to the leaf, but they don't 
um, chunk out the leaf at all. Marley's seen caterpillars that look like bird poop. Yes! So those are, well, there's a couple of different species, but a lot of times those are swallowtail butterflies that look like bird poop. Um, the other really cool thing about those swallowtail bird poop caterpillars, Marley, did you touch it? I need to know. Did you touch the caterpillar or did you leave it alone? <laughs> and bonus, I, I love that we're looking at creme brulee and strawberries. Yes, I guess people are hungry today. That's what I'm hearing. Marley, did you touch the caterpillar? They have this really cool defensive mechanism when you touch it. It looks like he has hand sanitizer, so I'm guessing he did not touch the bird poop caterpillar. Now, it looks very, very similar to bird poop, so I understand why you wouldn't want to touch it. But, um, let's do a bonus little drawing. Oh, you did! You did touch it! Did you get to see this? Alright, so you've got the head capsule, and I'm not going to draw the entire caterpillar. I'm just going to make it look like it's coming off my page. All right, so I, they look like bird poop. And they've got six legs all up here in the front. These are our true legs because they are caterpillar. Um, they've got a variety of simple eyes, right? Caterpillars don't have big compound eyes. They just have little eye spots. And I think it's generally six. I think caterpillars have six eye spots. And you can actually determine a lot of family characteristics by the, um, by the shape and the um, organization of the um, simple eyes on a caterpillar. But that's not what makes this bird poop caterpillar really cool. Now, if you touch it and you scare it enough, yes, Marley, it has the squirty orange thing. It has something that we call an osmaterium. It looks like this big Y, and a lot of times is either yellow or orange. You spell osmaterium like this. Um, so this is what we call an osmaterium, and it's a, it's a blow-up scent gland that swallowtail caterpillars have. So it sits right behind the head, and you can't see it naturally because it's actually tucked into the exoskeleton. But when these caterpillars get scared, they push, I believe, air. They p blow up this osmaterium. Maybe it's not air. Maybe it's a chemical. Anyway, they blow up this osmaterium so that it's nice and big, and it releases a really, really foul odor. Here's your nose. P.E.U. And an X for an I. I don't know. That is, this is just an unhappy nose. All right. Um, so they smell really, really horrible. Um, and that is one thing that helps protect your swallowtail caterpillars. Now, um... The funny thing about this, I don't know how many of you guys out there are Pokemon fans, but Caterpie has Osmaterium, right? Caterpie, the Pokemon, um, from the original 150, right? So if you're like me and you um, prefer the first 150, the first original over all of the other new generations, you'll know Caterpie and how it has that little red Y on the top of its head, and that's actually the osmaterium. And even if you look at, like, the descriptions of Caterpie, it says that Caterpie releases a strong odor from the Y-shaped thing above its head. So, that's a, uh, a fun osmaterium slash Pokemon story. Sure, the, I'm a big scary snake device. I guess it also could look like a snake tongue. I hadn't really thought of that, but it's definitely split, and it shoots out like that. Good point. Biomimicry? Um... So, let's see. I know that many cry 
try some melons? Oh, I bet you, I bet you the tortoise beetle has fluffy feet. Give me a minute while I flip him over. tortoise beetle and if you look we've got a coxa we have um we have a trochanter that's this triangle part here we've got a femur a tibia and then right here this is what i wanted to show you these three little tarsal segments i thought they had four These little tarsal segments, they are covered in, um, in thick, fine hair. So if you look at the bottom of the pads of tortoise beetle feet, they are going to have fluffy pads of hair on the bottoms of all of their feet. Now, this is not just a tortoise beetle characteristic. The characteristic with the, the fluffy feet actually belongs to the whole family of chrysomelids. So all of the leaf beetles, when you flip them over, they have fluffy feet. Now, um, tortoise beetles are only one subfamily or one type of leaf beetle. Oh, that's funny, Marley. If we if we could invent a New Year's blow toy that blew out two instead of one, kind of like a kind of like a snake. Oh, that would be fun. All right, let's see. Does looking like a poop have a special name? Not that I can think of. I don't think that we call it anything. You almost could call it... It's definitely a form of camouflage. Right? It's a form of blending in with your environment. Marley's got it. It's called Poopacree. That's it. We figured it out. We don't need to consider it anymore. I love it. That's it. <laughs> oh, man. And I know, Susan, I'm, I was sad, too, that um, Butterfree wasn't a swallowtail butterfly. Because it definitely should have been. And then they came up with Beautifly, which is one of the new generation Pokemon. And it is a swallowtail butterfly. And I was like, hey, if you were going to make a swallowtail butterfly, it should have been Butterfree. Fecal flage. Oh, man, Marley is on fire over there. <laughs> You've been looking for poop on willows. Ooh, raising a viceroy. That is an interesting, um, that's interesting. I, I have, um, I've never raised a viceroy, so that should be fun for you. Um, I actually did read this study recently. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah, it was, it wasn't as much a study as a, um, 
a summary of data that was already collected. I don't think he did his own research. I think he just went out into the world into the research articles that already existed and pulled information to summarize an issue that was being seen, which is the number of people who raise and release monarch butterflies. Now, we think we are doing a wonderful and awesome job by bringing these caterpillars in and rearing them and then releasing them back into the wild. Um, but there is a, there is this interesting correlation, and I should definitely find this article for you guys, um, but there's this really interesting correlation between this disease that spreads through monarch butterflies and the amount of people who are taking care of monarch butterflies in their homes. Um, because in the wild, the disease doesn't become very rampant by itself, right? Because you've got so much space um, between individuals that it doesn't really spread naturally super quick. But when people are bringing monarch caterpillars and rearing them inside... Um, and then maybe not cleaning their containers between hand or maybe not sanitizing them properly enough um, between um, they're actually spreading disease from one monarch to another um, and can and it has been shown to not be so great um, and so when I think about re raising monarch butterflies it's like I would love to go out and um, raise a bunch of monarchs but I would almost feel like I would have to I would have to know exactly what I was looking for and to know when to when to not release a butterfly, maybe a diseased butterfly that should be shouldn't be part of the population. Um, the other thing is that a lot of times the diseased butterflies would die off. Um, but because we care for them and we love them, we take care of them and then we release them. So we help them survive. Um, and then they spread the disease to others in the population. So, um, I wish I knew more about it than that. Um, but I did read that article semi-recently in the last couple months about, um, monarchs and how people who are honestly trying to do good, um, might be negatively affecting the monarch populations. No good. Yeah, planting milkweed turns out to be more complicated. Yeah, nature is complicated, guys. <laughs> People, we are always trying to do good, and that's all that they can ask from us, right? You know, we're trying to make the world a better place, and if we want to raise some caterpillars, you know. Um, but yeah, it gets a little complicated when you start looking at all of the fine details. I know, Ivea, and you know what? I'm glad that you are still around because I have thought about it multiple times over the course of, of the last couple of weeks, and I've tried to look it up where it's the camouflage. It's like uh, the opposite camouflage, where they are camouflaged not for hiding but for hunting. And it is in one of my classes somewhere. I have... A good number of three ring binders. Maybe I'm going to start scouring. <laughs> Viceroys definitely don't get enough love, Susan. And I 100,000% support you raising Viceroy caterpillars. I'm excited to hear about your adventures doing it. Um, I am lucky enough to teach students in China and Hawaii and Canada and have been able to see a variety of really awesome insects that students are collecting all over the world. Um, and I just think that it's really cool to watch people and insects interact in a way, you know, where they can kind of teach us things. <laughs> and, um... And especially when you're talking about kids raising insects, you know, they're also learning to observe and learning to look closely, like us nature journalers like to do. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, do we... Oh, yeah, Fluffy Feet. <laughs> I love that picture. Um, fluffy Feet's the characteristics of chrysomelids, all leaf beetles. So... I'm going to go ahead and show you a different subfamily of leaf beetle.
because it's sitting right here next to me. I have all of the chrysomelids in one unit tray, and I just brought the entire unit tray over here at some point. So, this is no longer a tortoise beetle. This is what we call the CPB, um, but I will go ahead and spell it out for you. Beetle. So this is the Colorado potato beetle, CPB. It is a chrysomelid, all right? So it is a species of leaf beetle. It has I always play, um, I, I like to play Rorschach with these spots up here and ask kids what they see. I always think that this centerpiece reminds me of, like, angel wings. I had someone tell me it looks like he has shoes back here, like, um, elf shoes. But what I wanted to show you about with my Colorado potato beetle is not the top, but the bottom. I just wanted to show you what he looked like first. All right, get out of the way, label. We don't need you right now. We'll take you off. All right, so when we were flip when we flipped over the um the tortoise beetle, and I said they have these little pads of fine hairs that are on the bottom of their tarsal segments that they walk with. That's all leaf beetles. So I figured I would show you the little tarsal pads of the Colorado potato beetle. Um, so right here, here, and here, you can see that they've got very, very thick but short kind of hairs, and they look like these pads. And those are in the bottom of their tarsi. So when they walk, um, I'm sure that those pads ha help them kind of hold on to their substrates. <coughs> oh man, Susan says if you turn the Colorado potato beetle upside down and look at the pronotum, it is the mustache of a melodrama villain, and I have to see this. Ha 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 ha! Do they walk on those pads? Yes, they do walk on those pads on the bottom of their feet. I don't know what a I don't know if I know what a plantigrade is. <laughs> I kind of love it. Oh man, all right, here's the thing. Now I'm gonna give myself a mustache. I wonder if I can do that. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Yes. Oh. I can't put him on top of me. I would have to uh I'd have to fix the green screen for it. Thought it was going to be fun. That's all right. Did it just shrink? All right, yeah, so that very much looks like a mustache. That's funny. I love it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I know that we are having a great time chatting about all of the buggy things. Um, I do have a long a day, a longer day tomorrow again. So I think I'm going to and we've been together. We've been together for an hour for a little over an hour now. Um, I really, really, really appreciate you guys coming and joining and hanging out with me. And the eyes. Yeah, the compound eyes are right here and here. Yeah. Or the eyes for the mustache. 
<laughs> or eyebrows. Um, I really, really do appreciate you guys hanging out with me and chatting bugs with me. It is definitely something that I love. I also love to hear that when you are outside, um, sketching or exploring your natural world, you are spending maybe a couple extra minutes, um, paying attention to the insects in your life, right? Looking down and, you know, maybe watching an ant walk or watching a bee pollinate flowers or watching I don't know go out and find yourself a baby tortoise beetle and watch it shake its umbrella <laughs> all right um <laughs> yay <laughs> um so thank you ladies and gentlemen for hanging out with me I super you had a Pepsis adventure last week, Marley. That's awesome. Do you want to share? Sawfly larvae. Susan, when you saw the sawfly larvae, were there lots of them? Um, they have this behavior where they kind of sit in a circle and they'll sit on kind of the same food source and then if you get, and if you scare them, they all wave at the same time and then they look like one large giant angry mass of in insect, even though they're all individual. Yes! They're waving their butts. See, Susan, it does all come back to butts. You found hundreds of Pepsis congregating? What? I'm, um, I'm kind of jealous. Were they congregating around, like, a nectar source? Like a, um, a tree that was oozing or sapping or something? <laughs> yes, this is my invisible beverage container. I also can do really fun things like maybe I can do it. We'll see. I did it with the kids earlier and I thought it was really funny. I can um I can do things like pull markers out of thin air. <laughs> um Yes. All right. So, yeah, some type of locust or mesquite. That makes sense. So a lot of times those tarantula hawks, they're going to be finding places where the tree is really sapping. And they're going to be drinking on that sap or fresh flowers. They're going to be drinking out of the, drinking the nectar. And those kind of sap, <coughs> sappy kind of trees, um, they're going to attract a lot of different hymenopterans, including Pepsis, but not limited to Pepsis. Um, you also, I don't know, there's all types of really fun stuff. Longhorn beetles even will come into sapping trees. Um, I was at one tree in, I believe, Kansas, um, that I actually went back to another year because it was sapping so heavily, and I had collected a cotton longhorn borer, a bunch of cicada killers, um, there were some cicadas on the tree, there were some huge, um, other, like, um, other pollinating hymenops, other wasps and things. It was just a lot of fun, and some velvet ants. And so I always, I wanted to go back there. And I went there a second year, and it was awesome the second time, too. And the third time I went back, it had been hit, hit by a tornado. And there was a, um, there was, like, a couch in the street uh, in front of it. And that was no good. So that tree doesn't exist anymore. So they just shook their abdomens one at a time. And they waved their butts. 
Yeah, so my guess is if they're waving their butts in the air like that, they're definitely sawflies. Now, if you want the actual characteristics, so the way to tell the difference between caterpillars and sawflies is you have to count the prolegs. So um, if you've got a caterpillar, you've got the six true legs up in the front, and then you have the little muscular legs, the ones that they call them legs, right? They're prolegs. They look like little rectangles that come down off of the body, and those are what they kind of walk with and they hold onto the branches with. Um, caterpillars are going to have... I want to get this right. Caterpillars are going to have, I believe, up to four prolegs. And sawflies have more than eight or more than nine. So there's a huge difference in the number of prolegs. Caterpillars are going to have a bunch of segments without prolegs. Um, I think they have a total of four. Whereas sawflies, their prolegs are going to go all the way along their abdomen. So I think they're going to have something like eight or nine pairs of prolegs. And so when you're looking out at those types of things, you'll be able to tell the difference between those. And if you sketched it, Susan, um, you might be able to go back and look at your sketch and count the number of prolegs are the number of um, the number of prolegs that they were waving around. Is the couch still available? You know that was back in the last time I saw that couch was back in 2016. So my guess is that it is not available. 2015 maybe. Wow, that was a long time ago. Alrighty, so um, I think we are we are closing in. Does anyone else have other buggy stories they want to share with me? Um, I don't have live insects with me today, but let's do that next week. Let's have a live animal session. Sound good? I can bring my tarantula, I can bring a scorpion, and well, heck, I'll just bring them all. We'll just chat about them all. Um, that'll be fun. <laughs> Thanks, Marley. I mean, I will stick around as long as you guys have bug stories because I love hearing them. Um, but yes, I probably should be heading off even though we love you. Oh, thank you. I hope to have a wonderful day with the little itty bitty kindergartners. I think that they are going, I, I'm really excited to walk around the garden with them and, and explore a little bit. All right, so thank you for hanging out with me and chatting. I super appreciate all of you. Um, I honestly, Thursdays are like the best nights because I get to sit and chat with you guys and talk bugs with a bunch of other nature nerds, and I love it. And um, I know that you guys also also love it. So um, uh this type of thing um, spreads via word of mouth. And I know a lot of you guys talk about me outside of the live stream and stuff, but that type of thing is always appreciated, you know? Convince your friend, one friend, to come and hang out with us, you know, that hasn't seen it. And even if they don't really love bugs, we might be able to... We might be able to rub off a little bit on them, you know, start a thing. So, I teach on OutSchool. Um, I teach bug club um, to 5 to 8 year olds. I teach a, teach a weekly insect studies for 9 to 12 year olds. Um, I'm, I teach a scientific illustration club where every week we do something like this. Um, but it's on Zoom so we can chat and see each other's faces and stuff. That's on OutSchool. Um, Feel free to subscribe to my channel. We are still growing, which is exciting. I think we're closing in on... Um, I think we're closing in on 1,400 subscribers, meaning that we're almost at 1,500. And I, um, and I think 1,500 is an exciting number. I don't know. It feels like a, it feels like a, uh, a ground mark, a point. 
feels exciting. All right, this right about here, this is uh, my QR code for my PayPal link. That is where you can send a tip or a couple dollars for a coffee for me. Um, if you really enjoyed the class today and you um, enjoyed chatting with me, you want to throw me a throw me a small tip. This is what I do. Um, I would love to continue doing it for as long as possible, right? And um, having those having those tips come in does help me continue to um, teach about insects and um, to keep the stories going, not only to you guys but to um, kids, to, to local kids in the area, to local city kids. We're trying to get their hands dirty. <laughs> All right, so. Thank you so much, everybody. Oh, all right. And my last question comes from Susan. I looked over in the chat, and she said, do I have any gall wasps? I do have a chalcidoid. Um... Yes, I do have a chalcidoid. I don't think that it's an oak gall wasp, but honestly, I am not sure what type of gall. I don't know if I even pulled it out of a gall. What would be interesting, Susan, is if you see those oak galls, you can um, take them and put them in a little container and wait for them to hatch so that you would have a specimen of them. That would be kind of cool. Um... put it in a vial and send it to me and I can put it under my microscope and we can look at them together. <laughs> um, only half kidding. But honestly, if you do end up with some of them, I wouldn't mind looking at them under a microscope. Uh, I did a little bit of research. I helped out um, identify some blueberry gall wasps. Hematis penelipinus. Hematis penelipinus something like that. There was a scientific name. I, um, there's this really interesting thing in blueberry gall wasps where, um, the blueberry gall wasp will create this gall on a blueberry plant, but then there are other parasitoids that attack the parasitoid called hyperparasitoids. And so there's, um, a whole system of parasitoids that all attack this one, um, gall wasp. Um, that attacks blueberries. And I had pulled apart probably 150, 200 galls and um, counted how many emerged from them and identified the different species that were emerging from these galls and stuff as part of a research project in a lab I was working in. Um, I don't know if that paper got published. Ah, there you go. Yeah, so you don't definitely don't collect anything from a place that's uh, controlled. You don't want to get, don't get in trouble for me. That's no good. Um, what's a light show? I will go outside and look for something interesting. When will you have time to do, oh, a black lighting show. Got it. Um, I actually went black lighting and I didn't have super great luck with bringing in a lot of interesting insects. Um, so I am actively looking for a spot for blacklighting. I know that I'll be blacklighting in July. Um, give me, Jody, give me, um, one more meet week to figure out some dates and locations where I have both, um, electricity to set up my blacklight and, um, internet, which is the important one. I need to be able to, I need to be able to connect live, um, which is just, it's, t it's becoming a little bit trickier than I expected. But, yes, I, um, I'm definitely going to be figuring that out shortly. Oh, you want to learn what to do? I... Yes. Yeah, we will do that. Um... Alright, give me, I don't, 
don't know exactly what day right off the top of my head. But I will come up with a day in the next two-ish weeks. And we can sit down and we can talk about blacklighting. I can show you my blacklight setup. Um, I actually have a brand new light that's coming down from Michigan shortly once I go up and get it that I'm excited about. Um, shortly. I will... Jody, I'll get you a, uh, I'll have an answer to you, for you for next Thursday. How's that sound? I'll have some date options, and then you guys can let me know, um, what days are best for you. Yes, that'll be good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I look forward to chatting with you next week. And, um, as always, reach out to me on, you know, Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. Watch my videos, do the things. Have a great week. And, um, happy bugging. Yes, I will post it to that messenger. That will work for me. Sounds like a plan. I'll reach out via, I'll reach out via that messenger. All right. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Happy bugging.